Well, good morning, everybody. And I'm very, very, very pleased to welcome you to the opening of the Careers Programme. My name is Conor O'Carroll. I'm Research Director at the Irish Universities Association. And I also chair the Programme Committee for, this, uh, for, for, for the entire Careers Programme. And I'd just like to say a few short words about that, because as with the Science Programme, the Careers Programme had a challenge. A challenge, and we received over 75 proposals and we had to pick 12 out of those. And it was a challenge. But I think we've put together over the days, over the coming days of ESOF, a really interesting program. A really interesting program, I think, which is of practical value to researchers. Many of you here co come along to listen to the science, to listen to new knowledge and what's happening in different fields. But what I hope you can gain from the careers program is the perspective of your own futures at whatever stage of career you're in, whether you want to remain in research, whether you want to go into different sectors. And I think we have a range of different events peppered over the next few days, which will help you in that, in that regard. And I can see here that um, well, I didn't do this alone, as we had a very good international committee. I can see some people in the audience there, Raymond Sels and Isabella Souza, uh, who, uh, who, were, who were very, very, very proactive in terms of, uh, of supporting us in, in, in this regard. The, the ESOF conference, I think, has to cover a lot of different areas. And for individuals who come here, whether they're PhD students or postdocs, or indeed at, at, at more advanced career levels, it's really important to hear about what, ha what happens, what can happen. The perspective that when one goes into research that one stays in research forever is, is false. We know, from, we know very clearly from data that the majority of PhD graduates will not pursue an academic or a research career. They'll pick up employment in other sectors. And I think one of the things which is, uh, which is most important here is that being a researcher is a highly valuable asset. And Jules Hoffman mentioned it last night when he talked about curiosity as a fundamental aspect of science, the curiosity, wanting to know more. And I think that people talk about transferable skills from research into different sectors. This is a core skill, the ability to be an independent thinker, to be curious, to analyze complex problems. That can be carried over into politics, into industry, into the public sector. And I think that's something which we must drive, we must, we must put out there as, as, uh, from the research community, that we have a lot to offer, not just to scientists and researchers and, 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 and seekers of new knowledge, but actually something to all society in its very different guises. Now, I'm very much delighted to welcome Daniel Funerio. Daniel is going to talk about his own career. I will say nothing about it, but this is a, this is a man who, has, who, is, who uh, was and is a researcher, but also a politician, and that's the most interesting career move. Daniel, thank you. Thank you um, very much for inviting me um, here. Um, I um, hope I will never ever get insulted by saying I'm a politician. <laughs> so, um, right, um, I would like to um, give you a perspective, my own perspective about careers. And I must say that when I was um, invited to uh, come here to speak, I didn't exactly know what was expected of me. And therefore, um, I sent an email saying I'll be very, very glad to come to Ireland, to come to Dublin to talk about careers, but what do you exactly expect me to talk about? So the answer I received, you can see on the screen, was the following. Uh, the purpose of the career program is to provide practical support to researchers for career development. I think this is an important message Sorry, one of the most important aspects is that many researchers take up a wide range of professions, like yourself. I think this is an important message, and indeed, despite what they might think at first, their research experience is highly valuable, especially their ability to critically analyze complex problems. Your own career will be of great interest to the audience. Now, the immediate question I was asking myself was, oh, really? It was for the first time that somebody said that my career would be interested to an audience. So, um, because the organizers thought my career was interesting to the audience, I'll very briefly go through it. So essentially, until I was 17, which was 1988, I was educated in Romania. I am Romanian. 
And, you know, at that time, Romania was a communist country, was in a deep dictatorship, and I decided to leave Romania. So I left Romania alone at 17 with basically no money in my pocket and established myself in Strasbourg. It was quite tough at the beginning. But then in 1999, um, I, all my life I wanted to pursue a research career. So in 1999, I got my PhD in chemistry under the supervision of Professor Len, who was a Nobel laureate from 1987. Then from 1999 to 2002, I moved to uh, the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla in California to do uh, my postdoc research over there. And from 2002 to 2006, um, I was a researcher at uh, AISD, which is a large research institute in uh, Japan, so in Osaka in Japan. In 2006, I won a Mar Marie Curie Excellence Grant. For those of you that aren't familiar with Excellence Grants, they were uh, the equivalent of ERC grants back then, except that uh, there were only 20 of them uh, every year. And I moved to the Technical University Munich in 2006 until 2009. And then in 2009, one day, while I was working in the lab, I received a phone call from the Prime Minister of Romania asking me if I wanted to be the Minister of Education, Research, Youth and Sports, which is a quite interesting phone call. And after a brief consultation with my wife, I said, OK, get my luggage. I'm going to the airport to be a minister in Romania. So I did. And uh, that lasted until uh, February 2012, when uh, there was a government change. And since, I became a senior advisor to the Romanian president on education and research uh, policies. Now, um, before going further, I'd like to say just one thing. In my application, for those of you that are familiar with Marie Curie grants, you know that in the application there's a point there, how are you going to participate into structuring the European research area? And when you apply for a grant, you have to say that. And I wrote there, I want to participate to structuring the European research area by becoming Minister of Education and Research in Romania. Now, they were crazy enough to believe it and to finance my Marie Curie Excellence grant. Good. So, um, since I um, was um, asked to talk about careers, I was asking myself um, what is the most important thing to get a good career and a path in life. And the only, the answer that I could come with, that the most important thing for a good career and a good path in life is to be in good physical condition. And to be in a good physical condition, you need to practice a lot of sports. So the fir my first hint to you, because remember, I was Minister of Education, Research, Youth and Sports, is to do a lot of sports every day, if possible. Now, before talking about careers and giving some hints to the, um, uh, what I believe um, my personal experience could help younger people uh, in their own career, uh, I'd like to talk a bit about the general context, and in particular, how I learned to um, understand the general context from the governmental position. First of all, uh, I really want to um, express my very um, personal opinion, but I think it's not only my personal opinion nowadays. I think we are in a long-term crisis. Uh, what we commonly call as a crisis, I, I think, is going to last for some time, but this is the bad news. The good news is that actually, I believe we are in a system change crisis. We are not in an existential crisis. What do I mean by that? Uh, you know, in the late 80s in Romania, we knew what it was a crisis. A crisis is when you open your fridge and there's nothing inside. That's what crisis is. None of us, we are all complaining that we are in a crisis, but none of us is complaining that we have problems with the day-by-day -day life. So that's why what I'm saying is that we are in a system change crisis and we are not in an existential crisis. That's the good news. Again, I'm not pretending what I'm saying here is the absolute truth. It's my own perspective, what I think today. Um, I believe that we are in, in this situation because um, Europe and the world at large is in an out of equilibrium state. I believe we are in a situation where there's an uneven power distribution between banks and governments. Why did we get there? I believe for a very simple reason. 
I believe that historically, banks and the private sector in general could hire brighter people than the politicians that populate governments. I have a pretty bad opinion about quite a lot of politicians that populate quite a lot of governments. Let me be clear on that. Now, this human resource imbalance at the level of the private sector, in particular banks and governments, led to something which I called the fact that banks take evidence-based decisions. Unfortunately, governments take political, most governments or a lot of governments take political, political decisions whose only goal is to win elections. Now, you're having on one hand the banks that take evidence-based decision with well-paid people, good people, and then you have governments which most of the time are afraid to take courageous decisions, are afraid to take um, um, decisions that might go against their own political interest. Obviously, in that context, I believe that we need to adapt our way of seeing life, but most important, and a message that I really would like to convey to you is that I believe that the governments must understand that their job is not to let the crisis become an existential crisis. I think the European Commission, I think a lot of governments understood that. The society becomes more and more complex, and as the society becomes more and more complex, I believe that there are more opportunities to multiply the resources, in a, there are more opportunities to multiply the resources in a complex environment than it is in a simple environment. There is nothing wrong with it, but it must be tackled when it's abusive. So to finish my general, what I believe to be the general context uh, perspective, I'd like to say that what we have seen, over the, especially over the past 20 years, is that the political disputes are less and less ideological, and one, when one talks about ideology, one talks about left, right, liberal, socialist, and so on. And ideologies, basically, address people based on emotions. So the political disputes are becoming less and less ideological, less and less emotional-based, and they become more and more about good and bad governance. Good and bad governments is evidence-based, is not emotion-based. So I think that the change, the major change that we have seen from a bipolar world where you had the communists on one side, the, uh, those of you that are over 40 remember very, very well, you, we were in a situation 20 years ago where we had the communists on one side, the capitalists on the other side, and then the communist system crumbled. This ideological fight basically uh, decreased. And what I believe we are seeing now, we are seeing a very deep change in the way capitalism is being seen. So this is the uh, general context that I wanted to fix before I can talk about individual careers. And the conclusions, my conclusion to what I've said before is that I feel very strongly that the society, and I have seen that when I was in government, and even now when I'm involved in political life, I believe that the society needs people that are trained to take evidence-based decisions. And nobody's better trained to take evidence-based decisions than scientists. And I believe that the society needs these people in high responsibility governmental positions. There is a very funny thing if you, uh, um, if you think a bit about it. Scientists get promoted because they get good results. Politicians get promoted because they use nice words. Actually, politicians developed a very, very good way, a very um, um, expert way to convincing by putting things in thick clouds. That's how I would see it. Now, there's one question I was asking myself. Don't you find ridiculous that there is a school for every single job except for governmental positions? If you want to become a waiter, you've got to go to school. But if you want to become a minister, if you want to become a secretary of state, there's no school for that. You just go, you just go to a political party, you have some nice speeches, you learn how to lie very well, and then at the end of the day, you might get a, a very high responsibility position. Um, one may laugh at first when we think about it, but actually, I believe it's a very, very serious issue. So. Uh, Therefore, I would like now to switch from this general context in which I hope I, could, I placed what I believe an important niche for scientists could be. 
Um, to my own experience, and again, I'm not pretending here that I'm saying a general truth, but what I found out through my experience might be useful for somebody, for a young person that wants to think about his or her um, career. What I found out reflecting back on my career is that one of the most fundamental and most difficult things to answer at any point of your life is what drives you in life. We are all driven in life by different things and we are driven by different things at different times of our life. And since I was asked to talk about myself, I feel very uncomfortable to talk about myself, but I was asked to do so. So um, I will, it was a very good moment to reflect what drove me in life all along. And I'll tell you exactly what drove me in life at every single step of my life. So if you can read on the screen, when I was 17, I was a young child in Romania, not knowing much about uh, the wider world, suffering from um, um, economic deprivations. What drove me in life, what drove me to leave Romania and to go west was because I wanted to drink Coca-Cola. I wanted to wear uh, Puma uh, shoes. I wanted to wear Levi's jeans. And more broadly, I wanted to see the world. That's what drove me at that time. When I embarked into a scientific career, when I embarked into a PhD, I wanted to make the largest supramolecule in the world. I wanted to be a good chemist. Later, I kind of got bored with chemistry when I finished my PhD, and I wanted to do something bigger. I wanted to expand um, the field of my knowledge. I wanted to expand the field of my expertise, and I went to uh, the Scripps Research, in Research Institute to move more towards biology with a very definite goal to develop techniques and to develop methods to deconvolute the biochemical complexity. For those of you that are in life sciences, essentially to understand pathways, to understand all the complexity of the living. So I wanted to expand from chemistry to biochemistry. Then when I moved from America to Japan, um, I did it for a very, um, uh, for a very personal reason, because at that time I felt that the Western world that I've learned all that I could from the Western world, and I wanted to see a bit a different perspective on life, of life, the Asian perspective of life. And that's why I moved to Japan, because actually I wanted to complete my personality by understanding how other societies, other cultures function. And I believe I did a good choice um, at that time. And I just want to make a short parenthesis here. Um, I was very convinced when um, I was very convinced that I, do, I, had, I made a good choice um, because I think it's very interesting if we compare how Western society reacts to big catastrophes like Katharina hurricane and how Japanese society reacted to a huge catastrophe which was the tsunami. And if we look back, we remember what happened, for example, in the United States. We, you all remember what happened um, uh, in that dome, the, that, that football stadium, when the Katharina hit, the Katharina hurricane hit. And I guess all of you have in mind the images of Japan, the organized, the smooth, um, the very different approach to crisis situations that the Western world and the Japanese world has. So this is what I learned from Japan. Now, when I moved back to Europe with the Marie Curie Excellence Grant, what drove me at that time was to do good science and to create a platform for my own future. When I entered into politics, I had a different drive, which was to change my country and actually to leave something behind. So first of all, I believe it's important that one understands and fixes very clearly what his or her own driver is for the life before um, considering a career. Now, um, I'll go a bit more into detail with a few things which I thought, um, which I learned through my career. First of all, I learned that there is no general recipe for success. We are all different. Our job as scientists is every day to invent something new, every day to do something new, every day to uh, uh, teach something new, every day to learn something new. So I think that all these books that tell you how to make a great career, how to behave in an interview, I think they're pretty useless for scientists because the added value of a scientist is that he or she is able to do something new every day. 
So I think this is the greatest asset. This is the greatest asset that the scientist has for a career. Then, I believe it's extremely important to only do what you enjoy doing. Many times I've heard people saying, today I'm doing something which I don't like doing because maybe that will place me in a position where tomorrow I'll be able to do something that I enjoy doing. I think that's the wrong approach because actually you just wasted a day of your life doing something you don't like doing. Also, many people, um, especially in crisis situations, are obsessed with permanent jobs. I think that's not good. I think one should not be obsessed with permanent jobs. There's only one permanent thing, that's death. I don't think we should be obsessed by permanent jobs. Also, for younger PhD students or postdocs, please let me give you a hint. Don't count on your supervisor for getting you a job. It's not his job to get you a job. I know that when you do a PhD or when you do a super, when you do a postdoc, you always want to go to that powerful guy that when you're done with your PhD or your postdocs, he's going to pick up the phone, call a friend and say, hire this guy or hire this um, um, lady because he or she is the best scientist I've met. Don't count on supervisors to get your job. It's not their business. It's yours. Now, Another thing that I found out is pretty useful is don't envy the others. The grass is not greener elsewhere. Of course, when you talk to your colleagues, everybody's going to like to say how well they're doing and how great their life is. But at the end of the day, that's not necessarily the case. So um, it's not useful to have an approach where you look into uh, somebody else's garden and you see, oh, the grass is much greener on his side. Um, I think this is just, uh, um, um, I wouldn't say waste of energy, but it's waste of uh, uh, brain space. So it's much better to focus on other things than uh, how green the grass is on somebody else's, uh, in somebody else's garden. Something very important, especially for younger people, uh, this was um, uh, something I found out later in life, always, when you plan your career, always think about your kids, even if you don't have one yet. Or I would say, especially if you don't have one yet, um, for obvious reasons. Now, something else that I'd like to say to PhD students and postdocs, because I was through that period and I was myself stressed, don't uh, feel safe. Uh, a good scientific background gives you access to virtually any job on Earth. If you've done science, feel safe. You're never going to end up unemployed. You're never going to end up with a career problem. You're always going to find something uh, um, nice for you. Then, um, I also like to convey the message that it's, it's very important and it's very nice to be geographically flexible. And when I say geographically flexible, I don't necessarily mean um, a flexibility to move from a, from a country to another. And I synthesize this by putting there a phrase, look at the people, not at the stones. If you want to visit stones, if you want to visit, uh, if you want to see stones, you can go in holiday. Uh, you'll often find out that uh, from that point of view, Japan, Ireland, Romania, America, Africa, Australia, New Zealand, or Russia, at the end of the day, they're just stones. What really matters most, the way in which you can enrich your personality most, is by looking at the people, understanding people, understanding the cultural value, the cultural added value of each society. You'll oftentimes find, find things that will enrich your own personality. It's very important to permanently question yourself, and I believe that it's very important uh, not to feel insecure when you're questioning yourself. Questioning ourselves always gives you a feeling of um, um, insecurity. Never do so. Um, life is in perpetual change, and I would say that rec in recent times, the rhythm of change is much faster than it used to be before, so that needs a lot of adap adaptation from, from each of us. So um, um, I think it's very useful to have this habit of permanently questioning yourself without that making you stressed or without that uh, uh, making it seem um, um, uh, pressurizing. Obviously, don't be afraid to seize opportunities that seem off track. Uh, oftentimes, we meet opportunities, but they did not enter our initial planning, and therefore we reject them. I think it's always important to always think about opportunities that seem off track. I would link this to something that I've learned. Um, it's always much better to put resources to improve your strong points 
rather than put resources to improve your weak points. If you improve your weak points, you're going to go from bad to average. But if you're going to put resources into improving your good points, you're going to get from very good to exceptional. And people usually pick you up because you're exceptional in some area or several areas, and not because you were successful in transforming a bad point into a medium point. Uh, last but not least, uh, I found it very important to plan ahead and also to consider changing tracks every 10 to 15 years. Um, here, uh, for those of you that um, are PhDs or postdocs, um, is there any chemist in the room? Right, okay. Now, uh, we chemists have a saying, you know, in your, when you're at the university, you learn about the methyl group. When you do your PhD, you learn that you study the ethyl group. Then when you go to the postdoc, you study and you learn about the propyl group. You get your first job, then you're going to study the butyl group. For those that are in chemists, these are just homologs, very similar things. But if you keep doing this, methyl, ethyl, propyl, butyl, at the end of the day, you'll become futile. So don't be afraid of changing. I don't see the point of a career where every day you just add something incremental to the previous day, especially if you're doing science or especially if you have high hopes for yourself. So consider changing tracks every 10 to 15 years. It's risky, but it's very rewarding. At least that's what I found out. Um, I, will get, I will be a bit more practical. Uh, I must admit I expected to see a bit more PhD students here um, because there are some questions that every PhD and postdoc student are asking themselves. I'll give you the answers I gave to myself when I was asking myself these same questions. Every PhD student, who, who's a PhD student here? Okay, every PhD student is asking the same question. When is the good time to finish my PhD? Am I right? No? All the PhD students want to know when to finish their PhD. The answer I gave to myself is the following. A good time to finish your PhD is when your supervisor doesn't tell you anything you did not know already. Uh, usually what happens, and usually the way PhD supervisors trick their PhD students is the following. Of course, a PhD student in his or her first year of PhD uh, for a PhD supervisor is kind of a pain because you have to teach the guy something. You're not, you're not getting nice papers in the first year of PhD. You're not... You as a supervisor are not maximizing the uh, output of a PhD student. After three years, when he or she now knows very well the subject, now he or she is very good in that field, you try naturally to have that person stay longer in your lab because that way he or she will produce more for you. Now remember, this is not a feudal system. Um, um, it's not a feudal system. It's a system where a PhD supervisor must teach you something, you must learn from him, but must also have the intellectual generosity to let you fly when time is up. So this is the way I would consider if I was a PhD student, and this is what I'll tell my PhD supervisor. Hey, you can't trick me anymore. Now I know about my subject just as much as you know. Now it's time for me to finish. If you didn't reach that time, stay there, work in the lab, get results, and reach that time. I believe at the end of the PhD, it's very important to plan ahead where do you want to be in 10 years' time. And I want also to tell you, it's very important to get married. As I said, I'm Romanian. Uh, I lived from 88 to 99 in France, 11 years. And at the end of my PhD, I took out of France what France has best, my wife. So I got married at the end of my PhD. Um, I found that very, very good. Uh, now, when you go to do a postdoc, when you go to do a postdoc, all the PhD students start one year ahead to have the same stress. Who's going to be my boss? I want to go to a Nobel Prize winner. But usually, you send a letter, 200 other people send him a letter, you'll probably get a standard answer, which is going to be no. Um, then you're looking around to see maybe a very young, very promising scientist, um, but then he might not be good enough so that you're guaranteed a job afterwards. 
I think the way to decide is first of all, go to a good institution. There's no secret. Good institutions are populated with good people. Good institutions provide you with a good environment for you to develop. Even if you're unlucky and you get on a bad postdoc supervisor, there are gonna be enough people around for you to learn great things. So concentrate on the institution and concentrate on diversifying the science you're doing. If you, if you work in supramolecular chemistry for your PhD, I would not advise you to do a postdoc in supramolecular chemistry. Go off the boundaries, but go far enough from your PhD thesis to learn new things, but close enough so that you can get some results in two or three years' time. So don't start something totally new, but go, as I said, far enough to learn something new and close enough to still get some results. Now, a great... Um, trap, a big trap that postdocs have is don't become a slave in a lab just because you're very good. Don't become your supervisor's slave just because you're very good. Some postdocs are very good. Supervisors have great advantages in keeping their, their good postdocs around, not allowing them or not encouraging them to get their independent job. So don't enter a dependency relation with your postdoc supervisor. In other words, um, do exactly the same way as you did for your PhD. When you have nothing more to learn from your supervisor, get your own independent job, if it's in academia or if it's elsewhere. Now, some of you want to go to academia. So after a PhD, after a postdoc, you're gonna get, you're gonna get there. You're gonna have your first lab. You're gonna have your first grant. You're gonna have your first independent research. You're gonna be an assistant professor. Then, when you're an assistant professor, obviously you want to progress in the career. And here you have two pathways. First pathway is to continue the research where you're good at. Ethyl, sorry, methyl, ethyl, propyl, butyl. If you do that, for sure, you're gonna get some nice papers, you're gonna get some nice citations, you're gonna go to conferences, and so on and so forth. I found much more rewarding when you get your first job. Go for gold. I would say when you get your first job, when you have the enthusiasm of your first lab, when you have the enthusiasm, when you have the power, you have the youth, you have the time, you have the energy, go for gold. Try the research you always wanted to try, but never dared, never had the courage to. Go for high-risk projects. Oftentimes they fail, but oftentimes they give the highest rewards. If you're not gonna do it then, you're never gonna end up doing because you're gonna get close in running the same science, doing the same incremental progress. And also, don't get closed in senseless competition. Your colleague did propyl, now you're gonna do butyl. Or your colleague um, did a, made a um, three nanometer molecule, you're gonna make a 3.2 nanometer molecule. Be courageous. High risk, high reward. That's at least my perspective, I'm, again, I'm not saying is the, is the truth. It's worth trying. When you have your first job, you have your first team of people. If, if you're gonna talk to people, to, to Nobel laureates, all of them will tell you, or a lot of them, sorry, will tell you that the greatest ideas, uh, and I understood there are some keynote speakers, uh, Nobel laureates here, their greatest ideas, and a lot of their ideas came early on. Of course, experience helped them develop it, or experience helped them pick up on the good ideas later on. But I think it's very important to be courageous early on in your career. Now, uh, before I um, go towards a conclusion, uh, and again, I, feel I'm, I really feel very uncomfortable talking about myself, but since I was asked to do it, I reiterate that um, I will do it. When I, when I was preparing for the speech, um, I was trying to think if I reached my objectives at every single step? Uh, the answer was yes. Uh, I left Romania, I went to France. I did wear Puma, I did drink Coca-Cola, I could buy Levi's jeans. When I was doing my PhD, yes, I became a decent chemist. I made a great supramolecular, um, I made a great supermolecule, I um, um, was leading a field of research. I had some success during my postdoc. The same, the research in Japan, nice papers. I developed a new method for uh, a microarray method for, for those of you that are familiar with um, this area of science. Uh, 
my grant at the Technical University Munich was okay. I succeeded to become a minister in my own country. But then, a question which I still didn't uh, totally answer is if during the two years of my mandate as a minister, I did manage or I didn't. Did I or didn't I manage to change my country a bit and to leave something behind? Um, I don't want to bore you with, and I'm, uh, also it's not my goal here to tell you what I did as a minister, um, but I just want to uh, very briefly um, tell you the sensation of somebody that was in the eye of the cyclone when the crisis hit very badly. When we went to government, we took a country that had minus 8% economic growth, so basically a drop of minus 8%, more than 6% per year budget deficit, rising unemployment, and a lot of structural, um, major structural disequilibria. We took some extremely tough and extremely unpopular decisions. Let me tell you one of them. All public servants had their salaries cut by 25% for one year. It's extremely tough to tell to one and a half million people that you are going to cut their salaries by 25%. It's almost criminal to do, to, 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 um, 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 to be in a, in a position where you have to take such a decision. The alternative would have been the country to go bankrupt. So we avoided bankruptcy by the blink of an eye. Uh, but these very tough and very unpopular decisions, and it took a tremendous amount of strength and nerve to take these decisions. Luckily, they were understood by the people. And the only backlash, if you want, is our political popularity went down, but that's that's a, fair price, that's a fair price to pay for saving your country. Now, two years after that, we, last year we closed by a plus, more than plus 2% economic growth, very low deficit, our finances are in order, the country was stable. So, um, um, at, at least from that point of view, um, I, feel, I feel good that the only price we had to pay for stabilizing, stabilizing the country is a decreased popularity in the polls. Um, there are small, I, I, I will close by saying, sharing with you something that um, was um, for a long time, I was thinking about it for a long time. Oftentimes you take very small decisions which have fundamental, fundamental effects. And you maybe, maybe you don't always realize the effects that a small decision when you are in such a powerful position, has on the people of your country. Last year, I took the decision to install video cameras in all exam classes where people have their baccalaureate in Romania. The year before, we had almost 90% success rate at the baccalaureate exam. After installing video cameras, the success rate dropped to 45%. Basically, it was a major societal shock. 100,000 kids failed their baccalaureate. It was the first time in the history of Romania that that happened. Needless to tell you that next day, I, usually I was going without bodyguards, but next day the security services uh, uh, gave me three bodyguards with uh, pistols, um, just so that there's, I'm not in danger. Uh, what was the effect? So a small action install video cameras in exam rooms. What was the effect one year later? One year later, people understood, you gotta be serious, you gotta learn to get your baccalaureate. We have seen the absence rate of kids to school dramatically decreased. Almost nobody beforehand, almost nobody wanted to go to professional and vocational training. Romania was lacking people that would put, uh, I don't know, workers, qualified workers, because everybody could get very easily to the baccalaureate and they went to that road. Now, um, 25,000 kids this year chose to go to professional schools, which I think is very good and our country needed that. Another effect, only the best universities survived because instead of 160,000 kids going to universities, so basically, every university could have customers. 
Now, only about 100,000 or even less than 100,000 kids go to university. So only the good universities survived. Competition. So I just wanted to close by giving you examples how somebody that is in the public service, how somebody that has the power, can sometimes take small decisions, can make uh, small changes, but with profound, with, with profound um, society change. In this case, it was for the good, I believe, and, I, um, and when people believe like me that it was for the good. Um, but sometimes you must be careful, because sometimes um, when you are in a power position, um, you might take small decisions that have bad effects. That's why it's even more important that people, smart people, people that can take evidence-based decision, get into public life. I would not, I don't feel comfortable leaving my country in the hands of people that are not used to take evidence-based decisions. Uh, let me just finish by two um, um, phrases which uh, probably aren't mine. Many other people said them, but I think they are important. Don't be afraid to be courageous in life. Others will, and those that are courageous in life will overcome you. Second, don't be retractile. Don't be afraid. Let others be afraid. Um, all of you, you have this, um, the PhD students that are listening today, or the postdocs, you have this great asset. You're a scientist. It's probably the greatest asset a human being can have. Um, therefore, you can afford to be courageous. The last by one phrase, it's something I read when I was very young. It's something that William Somerset Morgan said, a writer from the 30s. Uh, he read his speak in the 30s. Um, when I first read that, <laughs> I thought it was very interesting. There is a funny thing about life. If you refuse to accept anything but the best, very often you will get the best. I applied with a lot of success this phrase, especially when I chose my wife. So, um, thank you very much for listening. Um, for those of you that are still involved in science, and I understand most of you are, let me tell you a last thing. Um, when I was doing science, I thought I had the greatest job on earth. I never thought there can be something more rewarding than doing science. In the recent years, I did find there is something more rewarding than doing science, and that is to serve your country. Thank you very much. If um, you have questions or if there's a question session, I guess I'll be very glad to um, hear to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel, for a most enlightening talk. If we have questions, we have roving microphones. And could you please just identify yourself and then ask the question, please? Thank you very much. Hi, uh, my name is René Schroeder. I'm from Vienna. I am a biochemist, another chemist. I have one question. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. There were many really interesting thoughts. But I would like to know, uh, your career is very straight in a way. What is the career of your wife? And would you have been able to do the same career if you would be a woman? Uh, I think this is a very, very uh, sensible and very important question. Uh, before I start answering exactly the question, I'd like to make one remark. Uh, people talk a lot about um, equality, equity between men and women. Uh, for example, uh, my, let's say, uh, my university is a great university because 50% of the academic staff are women. So my university is doing great. But they oftentimes forget to say something. We need equity, not only in terms of numbers, but also in terms of seniority level. Because if, if there's 50-50 men to women, uh, men to women, but 90% of the women are assistant prof and they are blocked and have problem getting associate prof or full prof, then it's not, it's, we, we aren't there where we want to be. Now, talking about my wife, she, she, would, she would hate me if she knew I was uh, answering you this question. 
Um, but um, hopefully, she, <laughs> hopefully she's not looking at the uh, webcast. Um, uh, my wife was very passionate about dancing. So uh, she was a ballerina dancing, the dancer. She was dancing in a ballet. Um, later, when we moved to America, she had a dramatic change of career. She became a computer scientist. She even has a scientific paper um, in computer sci science for, she worked for a chemistry company, for a, for a startup biochemistry company in uh, San Diego. And uh, uh, she developed together with her team some great things, so she became a computer scientist. And uh, so basically, ballerina until 99, computer scientist until 2004 when our first child was born, when our daughter was born. And ever since, she decided to totally devote herself to raising uh, the kids. So since 2004, she decided it was her own decision. I would have supported her, whatever she would have wanted to do. If she wanted to continue with her career, I have totally supported her. Uh, but she decided to uh, totally devote herself to uh, raising the, the kids. It, it, was a, it was a decision, let's say, un, unpressurized um, decision. Um, what was, there was another part of your question? Oh, if I would have done the same if I was a woman. I always, it was always easy for me to uh, think what would I have done if I was less good than I am. But I never could answer what would I have done if I was better than I am. So therefore I cannot answer what <laughs> I would have done if I was a woman. But I can tell you this, the best man for your job is a woman. <laughs> the next question, please. I do, I do have m m most, um, sorry to expand on this, because I, I believe it's a very, very important question. Um, um, it's more, people I think don't treat this seriously enough, really. Um, and just two weeks ago, um, I had the situation where a great woman scientist called me up and said, look, um, please help me find the job. She's a great scientist. She said, please, please help me find the job in grant management because um, I want to marry and have kids. This is a problem. This is a problem. And I guess like her, there are many people. I do think it's an important question. Maybe I just should be personal. I'm a woman, I have two children, and I decided never to get married, because in the 70s, when I had the age to get married, the law in Austria was that women had to obey husbands. And that was also in many countries in Europe, that I think for a woman to have a husband, not in, have a husband in science is good, but for a woman to make a career when the husband is not in science, I think this is not so good for the career. Well, uh, I do think it's, it's compatible, but it's let me, not let that me, easy. Let me reassure you, yeah. uh, for many years, for many years, my wife never understood how can I work 14 hours a day in a bad smelling lab on a 1,000 euro salary. So I think it's not only men that don't understand women scientists. I think that a non-scientific spouse or partner has a problem understanding what's the drive for a scientist if he or if himself or herself don't feel this. It's a very particular drive that we scientists have to spend our life in a lab and for, for a oftentimes salary which is not good, independent of the country. Scientists are not paid well in any country of the world, or at least most. So it's difficult. It's very difficult for a non-scientist to understand a scientist uh, uh, spouse or partner. But that rule that the, the, uh, I couldn't survive in that society where the uh, uh, wife has to obey the husband. <laughs> I'm much more comfortable obeying my wife. <laughs> Thank you. Just to remind you, actually, before we go to the next question, that there are two dedicated sessions to women in science in the, in, in the careers program itself. So uh, it, I, I think they'll be worth going along to. Next, next question, please. Uh -huh. Okay, I'm Maria Bostanaru from the Yominku University of Architecture and Urban Planning in Bucharest. Uh, I'm actually a speaker in the role models from the Marie Curie Fellows Association you have just mentioned. I will go over to my question from what was previously said. So my personal opinion is that in Romania, women 
are not in a bad position. There are a lot of heads of department, vice rectors, whatever. What I find is that in Romania, mobility isn't valued. I lived 11 years uh, abroad, and when I came to Romania, I went to the lowest position, and then when finally positions were deblocked, it was required to have a PhD and so on, and it's a nightmare. And um, I wrote you an email last year when you were minister about if you think about promoting Marie Curie Fellowship because they are not uh, really known. I mean, at my university, nobody knows what this is. And since then, I've been at uh, Marie Curie Roadshow in Bucharest in May, and there are a couple of other Marie Curie fellows who have good performance, who are asking me if there is possible to do an audience at you about this. And to come back to my previous argument, I, it's about if it would have been good to have uh, valued mobility not only in the past five years and experience and not just do you have a doctorate or not mm -hmm. to be promoted because this mobility is not so easy right. to get it. Right. Um, this is a question which uh, is of interest for Romania, but um, I'll try to give an answer that both answer clearly your question related to Romania, but also is of interest for others. Um, both things that you said, which means that in Romania women are not in a bad position, and the fact that mobility is not uh, valued, the all, all these, both these things stem from our communist heritage. In communism, women didn't, were not in a bad position um, related to men. Also, mobility was not valued because the communist societies were essentially frozen societies. Um, now, um, mobility is valued now uh, because, as you know, all Romanian universities are being evaluated and they receive financing according to their ranking into the um, evaluation. Mobility is one of the key parameters of evaluations. So from now on, universities will be um, encouraged to value mobility. Um, I disagree with the fact that you say that Marie Curie is not well known enough at the level of higher management of universities. I assure you, it's very well known, but they don't want, and this was a big fight that I had with university rectors, they don't want to promote you. Why? Because you're oftentimes much better than those that have the political power in universities and that they try to dislocate. So essentially, they are lying to you when they tell you they don't know about it. They know very well, and they know very well that you are much better than them, and they know very well that by allowing you to reach good positions in universities, you're weakening the political power of what I call, and those that speak French understand, um, the, the mandarins of research. And that's one of the reasons why I had big fights with many universities, because they were not mobility-oriented enough and excellence-oriented enough. I think and, and, uh, sorry, and sorry. of course, I give you, you have my email, I give you my phone number after this, you can reach me anytime. Now, now that I'm, you know, when you're a minister, you have a lot of power. When you're advisor to the president, you have less power, but more influence. <laughs> I think we've actually, interestingly enough, touched on two key themes for the, for the program, and that is on mobility and on women in science, and we'll come back to that again and again. I would, if there was one more question, I'd take it. Uh, but just one, I think, because we need to move to the next part of our program. So, oh, we have. Hello, Hi. thank you very much for the interesting presentation. My name is Kemel Mansouri. Um, I'm from Tunisia and I'm working in Milano Bicocca in Italy as a Marie Curie Fellow for a PhD um, ITN program. So, my question is um, how do you know the best? You said that it's always better to choose the best. Okay, for myself, it was just a feeling before choosing this program, but then I found out it's the best. In, in your case, I'll, I'll let myself take the same example as, as you did um, when you chose your wife. You said it, she, she was the best. So, I mean, how do you know always the best as, as in choosing um, the partner or uh, the lab? Um, sure. Is uh, it just the feeling or there's something else? Thank you very much. Uh, I, I hope everybody understood uh, that uh, a lot of the things, well not a lot, but some things that I said uh, were quite meta metaphorical. 
Um, if I didn't say my wife was the best, I'd have a problem at home. So. <laughs> um, and also, I, I am not going to give here uh, marital counseling. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, um, obviously, you know, good and best are philosophical concepts and are far beyond the discussion that uh, we can have here. Uh, it's all related to the, to the objectives that you set yourself. That's why it's very important to set clear objectives and to be well informed. Um, but you know what? Oftentimes, oftentimes reputation, it's a very good measure. Uh, reputation oftentimes is correct. Uh, of course, when you're a politician and when you're a politician and all the media is criticizing you, then don't go by reputation. But um, um, I would say there's no general recipe, but you have to choose according according to the best planning you can make. So uh, set set clear objectives. Then it will be much easier for you to identify solutions and possibilities to the objectives that you, you, you set yourself. And as far as it goes to, to family and wife, then, you know, then there's, just one, there's just one parameter, love. <laughs> Thank you very much, Daniel. I'm sorry, I won't take any more questions as we do have to move to the next part, but I will say that Daniel is speaking again this afternoon in the Engaging in a Researcher's Career in the 21st Century, a session at four o'clock, with, along with other researchers as well. So I think there'll be opportunity to continue the discussions there. And I ask you once again to thank Daniel for his frank, forthright, and very honest uh, op opinions that he's given here today. Thank you very much. I'd also, I'd also like to take the opportunity to, uh, to acknowledge and thank Intel Ireland who sponsored the Careers Programme and indeed one of the, I, I believe, the unique aspects of Intel and uh, ESOF in Dublin is the fact that Ireland is an open society in terms of recruitment. We recruit lots of international uh, researchers in universities and indeed uh, we 35% of, of, of researchers in universities come from outside the country. This is the same for many of our companies, not just the, the lar our large multinationals that are based here in Ireland, but also our Irish companies in ICT and bio. So you never know, you might get a job here while you're here. Now, we'll move to the next part of the program, and I'm delighted to welcome Professor Enric Banda. Enric is director of the Catalan Institute for Research Innovation Foundation, and he's got a very strong Irish connection because he's been chair of our Boyle, National Boyle Medal. He was also a reviewer, indeed, for one of our national programs on research infrastructure. And uh, it's, it's always a delight to have him in Ireland. Uh, but he's coming here today as president of Euroscience, as he's about to make, present the awards to the European Young Researchers. Thank you very much, Enric. I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're right, my, my talking about careers, um, my scientific career, which I have one, um, has brought me to this country, to Ireland, you know, and to other countries, to review, as, as um, he has said, uh, to review programs, to review um, funding schemes and so on. And when you visit the same country several times and, and do some service to the country, you end up loving the country. So I love Ireland. And, and I was very lucky when, when uh, Dublin got the, um, you know, the, uh, was awarded to um, organize um, this ESOF um, in Dublin 2012, which has been a huge success. Uh, as president of Euroscience, of course, um, uh, and, and, and you being enrolled in, in ESOF, I'm not going to tell you what uh, Euroscience is. Uh, by now you know it. But I'm going to remind you in, in just a couple of minutes that uh, Euroscience has made, uh, since the beginning, Euroscience is 15 years old now. It, we are a, a, a young young scientific in our career. I mean, 15 years is nothing. But um, during these 15 years, we have uh, paid a lot of attention to young researchers. And this uh, is so partly because our first president, the late uh, Claude Codon, was very insistent that Euroscience had to devote time, effort, and energy to, uh, to the young scientists. 
and and in the in the late 90s i i was in different position in my career um and uh, I remember him, you know, organizing a, a number of things with young scientists on, on new professions, and, and he was extremely active on that. Uh, and since then, uh, Euroscience has done a number of things uh, with young scientists. Uh, for instance, uh, we have been working with uh, with others and, and with the Commission in the in the European Charter for Researchers, which is basically devoted to to the young. Uh, researchers and we've been lucky lucky uh, to participate and happy with the results um, right now there's a survey going on with young scientists in Europe um, uh, on working conditions and I think uh, whenever we have that report out it will be of interest to all of you to all researchers particularly the young ones we have had uh, a privileged um, relationship with uh, with some uh, associations of scientists, of young scientists, like Eurodoc. I mean, we have um, uh, done a number of things together with them. Um, well, we, we have participated together with our institutions in getting 60 young researchers to this is off here, to Dublin. So we do practically everything with our modesty and with our resources to help the young scientist. One way to um, help a young scientist, and, and we, ho we all have been young, is to stimulate, motivate through prizes. And this is something that we installed a few years ago, and, uh, and that's why we are here, I mean, to deliver the European Young Researchers Award. This we give one every year, but we deliver the prize the year of is off, so that's why we deliver two today. Um, the European Young Researchers Award is granted to researchers demonstrating outstanding research performance. At the same time, the award aims to inspire early stage researchers and experienced researchers to incorporate a European dimension and perspective into their research. So the, um, uh, this is done as we know how to do it in science with an independent committee that will get the, the candidates, will study, will discuss and will decide who is the winner in, in, in each occasion. Uh, it is true that we uh, change uh, the rules slightly. Sometimes we devote, um, or we are tilted towards PhD students and sometimes we are more tilted towards uh, recent doctors, recent PhD. Um, the criteria are clear from the beginning, so the committee has mm, practically no reason to, um, to disagree, except the disagreements we all scientists have when it comes to excellence, that we all know, but we are not to, to discuss this. But we take into account scientific quality first. We only want uh, excellence. But after that, we look at the European dimension. We look at the international team worker. I mean, be part of the team because he's a PhD student or being a young leader already because he's a postdoc. And we do look at, as well, whenever possible, at the communication qualities. Communication nowadays is very important. The times in which scientists uh, could avoid communicating what, what they did is gone. It's gone. We have to communicate. We are not all good communicators. Some do better, some do, you know, worse. But we do have to communicate. And it is important that we look at the young and we stimulate the young researchers to know how to communicate, or at least to, to, to bear in mind that communication is, is important. So with that, um, we have two uh, awardees um, today. And the first one is Dr. Dorte Ransbeck. In recognition for her outstanding contributions during her PhD work in nanosciences, demonstrated by an impressive number of publications, including numerous collaborations with other European scientists. Can I ask Dorte to come to the stage?
Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And first of all, thank you for, to Euroscience for this very prestigious award. It's a great honor for me to receive this and also to be here today. And I cannot even begin to explain how much it has meant to me, not only personally, but also in terms of my career opportunities. So thank you. So I will tell you a little bit about the research that has formed the basis uh, for this award. And uh, it is about one of the most important, both scientific and political issues we are facing, facing today, namely energy. And not only energy, more specifically, how we can utilize renewable energy in a much more efficient way and to a much higher extent than we do today. Because the problem with renewable energy is, of course, that it is unevenly distributed, both in terms of place and in time. So if we want to utilize the renewable energy, uh, not only when it is just harvested, but when we require the energy, we need to devise some methods to store it efficiently so that we can transport it and utilize it whenever we have the need for it. And one way of doing this is by using the electricity we gain from renewable energy sources to produce hydrogen by splitting water into oxygen and hydrogen, and then we can store the hydrogen either in large stationary storage facilities or we can devise smaller storage systems which can go into a hydrogen car. And a hydrogen car will of course also have a fuel cell which can transform the hydrogen back to electricity and it will have an electrical motor to drive the vehicle. And ideally the only exhaust from such a car would be water, meaning that we have formed a completely environmentally friendly energy cycle. And in order to get a storage system that is efficient, compact and light enough to go into an energy efficient car, it, we, we can utilize the fact that many metals can store, they can absorb hydrogen in a very dense manner. In fact, many metals can store more hydrogen than there is in pure liquid hydrogen. And the idea is then that we can apply heat to the system, which will make the hydrogen diffuse back out of the metal, and we can lead it into a fuel cell and thereby retain the, the electricity. So what I have been working on is, by, is uh, preparing and designing novel materials based on novel compositions of metals, which gives us a whole new set of properties in terms of storing the hydrogen. So I have worked with uh, developing a new set of uh, solid state preparation methods, and this has to this day given more than 30 novel materials, and all of these have been studied in great detail on the nanoscale. And in order to do this, I need to use high intensity X-rays. And therefore, I travel quite frequently to large synchrotron facilities all over Europe, which can provide this high intensity X-rays. And what happens when you shine X-ray onto a material is that you will get an X-ray image, of course. And like all of us in here has a very uh, unique set of fingerprint each material have a unique uh, X-ray image. And by treating these images and using diff different mathematical approaches to model these images, we can determine exactly where each atom is positioned within these metal complexes. And thereby, we can also study how the hydrogen interacts with the metals. And to take it a step further, we also utilize this technique to store, uh, study the properties of these materials. And what we typically do is that we heat the material up while we take very rapid X-ray images. And thereby, we get sort of a movie of how the material transforms as a function of temperature. And we can say a lot about the properties in terms of storing the hydrogen. And thereby, we have gained a whole new set of trends in terms of composition versus the properties, and this has now given us a toolbox to begin to design these materials with specific properties. So I would like to acknowledge a long list of international collaborators from all over Europe, and of course I would like to extend my most sincere gratitude to my 
PhD supervisors, Professor Fleming Biesenbacher and Associate Professor Tom Jensen, and a long list of foundations for funding, especially the Faculty of Science at University of Aarhus and the Interdisciplinary Einanu Science Center, who has uh, funded my PhD, and the Carlsberg Foundation, which are now funding my postdoc at MIT in Boston. And thank you for the kind attention. Thank you. Congratulations. Well, thank you, Dorte, for uh, uh, a very nice synthesis of uh, the reasons why the, the committee thought that you had to be the winner. Uh, I, I forgot to mention before that the number of candidates for 2011 was uh, 22. Now for 2012, uh, the number of candidates, candidates has increased by more than 50%. The, number, the total number has been 50 candidates. And the winner is Dr. Davide Scaramuzza in recognition of his outstanding contributions during and after his PhD work on computer vision and robotics demonstrated in numerous and highly cited articles and book chapters. The European dimension of his work, of his leadership, in demonstra is demonstrated by the leading role in the successful application for the EU project as FLY. Now, Davide, for very good reasons, uh, cannot be with us today, but uh, he decided that he would send um, a friend of him, uh, and therefore I would call uh, Luca Balan to stage. I hope you will handle the certificate okay. to Davide, and if you want to explain what Davide has asked you to explain. <laughs> Thank you. So, so I'm, okay, perfect. My name is Luca Balang, as you, thank you for the presentation. I'm from ATH Zurich. Davide is my friend and also colleagues, and uh, he had some conference issues, so he cannot be here, but he's very honored to have received the prize and would like to thank Euroscience and all the selection committees for the prize. Um, Davide got his PhD from ETH Zurich in 2008, and then he got a postdoc position in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia. And finally, this year, in 2012, he got a professorship position at, for robotics at the University of Zurich. In particular, from 2009 to 2011, he was the coordinator of the project, European project as fly. During this presentation, I will present the major contribution of David in the framework of this project. So, David's research interests are mobile robots for real world environments. In particular, during his career, he has worked on enabling autonomous navigation of self-driving cars and micro-helicopters. In this video, you can see on the two main achievements of Davide's research. In the left video, an example of autonomous micro-helicopters for search and rescue operation, while in the right video, an example of self-driving car. Davide's main research goal is to build robots that are truly autonomous and have the ability to assist and help people and eventually save their life. There are many real world situations where the use of robots is determinant. As an example, think about power plant inspection, like the figure above, uh, search and rescue of victims of avalanches, or monitoring and evacuation of crowded areas. These are all situations where robots could make the difference. This is an example, this is the Fukushima power plants after the 2000, 2011 tsunami. So ground ro robots there were used to inspect the indoor areas teleoperated wireless by experts. However, because of obstructions, these robots were not able to exhaustively explore all the interiors. So one solution could have been to use, instead of ground robots, use and complement them with micro helicopters. Micro helicopters are very agile and they can easily avoid obstacles and thus overcoming the limitation of ground robots. 
However, how can these robots fly autonomously? So, most of the today's flying robots rely on GPS, Global Position System, to navigate from a point A to a point B. However, in situations like indoor environments inside a building or urban canyons between skyscrapers, where GPS information is either absent or not reliable at all, these systems simply does not work, do not work. As an example, in this picture below, you can see the actual trajectory of a small helicopter in red, and in black, you can see instead the estimated, the trajectory estimated using a GPS. While the visible inaccuracy of the GPS information may be good for car navigation, these are absolutely a problem for flying very small helicopters, like 50 centimeter helicopters. An alternative solution has been bought by the European project named as Fly, of which Davide was the coordinator between 2009 and 2011. The partners involved in this project were for France, Switzerland, Greece, and Germany. The goals of the S-Fly project was to enable autonomous navigation of micro helicopters in GPS-denied environment for search and rescue operation, like in case of fire. The contribution was the reliance of solely and inexpensive cameras mounted on, an helicopter, on the helicopters to locate their position in the environment. This camera track interest point in the images and build up 3D maps of the scene. These maps were then used as a reference for the helicopters to fly and follow trajectory between navigation points. Here you can see on the video, there is an helicopter that is flying using video-based controller and the other GPS con controlled. So in practice, uh, we saw that uh, the vision-based system was much more stable than the GPS one even outside. So the S-Fly project ended with a live demonstration in the firefighters training area in Zurich in 2012. There, Davide's team simulated a search and rescue operation where three helicopters had to explore an unknown environment and localize victims. These helicopters were fully autonomous. Flight control was performed by computer vision technique and runs entirely on board of the helicopters at 30 frames per second. Davide envisaged that in the near future, this micro helicopter will play a major role in tasks such as search and rescue, inspection, and environment monitoring. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Luca, and hope you will convey our congratulations uh, to Davide. Uh, and we have come to the end of the session. Uh, thank you for coming, and um, I hope you will keep enjoying the rest of the sessions today. Thank you very much. <laughs>